Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Barbara Conde. I'm a fourth year PhD student from the Open University, and I'm really happy to be joining today's session. I think it's my first GoGN session. Um, and well, just today I have decided to talk a little bit more about one of the topics of my PhD. <clears throat> These are basically the self, -regula self regulatory processes that adult learners use in uh, language MOOCs, also commonly known as LMOOCs. Um, my connection is not that stable, so I'm going to switch off my camera and you're just going to listen to my voice while following the slides, if that's okay. Okay, so let's just start. Well, as you can see in the content, I'll start by looking at the current state of language MOOCs during these unprecedented times. <clears throat> And um, then I will present the model of self-regulated learning posed by Zimmerman and Moylan. That's basically the framework of my uh, whole thesis. And that will help us to understand the concept of self-regulated learning in MOOCs. Uh, finally, I'll describe my research and some of the findings I've discovered so far. Right. So a quick search on Google tell us that the queries about MOOCs have increased by almost 2.4 times during COVID-19. And queries about online language courses also follow the same trend during this time. The popularity of MOOCs during the pandemic is also reflected on the high number of new users that have registered to different MOOC platforms, as you can see here. These platforms have welcomed in 2020 more than 30 million users, to be precise. Now, if we do the same search for the keywords of language MOOCs and LMOOCs um, <coughs> in Google Trends, it's quite different. However, uh, a recent review of MOOC stats and trends listed foreign language learning in the top 10 of most popular courses amid the pandemic with 507 language courses offered by the main providers at the time I'm giving this presentation. Just double check, 507, yeah. Some authors agree that LMOOCs, language MOOCs, will be on offered despite the challenges involved. One of these authors is Ana Jimeno Sanz, who has written about LMOOCs as a type of innovative language pedagogy in the recent report edited by one of my supervisors, Tita Beben, and Fernando Rosel Aguilar. As Jimeno Sanz state, people have to self-regulate their learning to study on MOOCs that are suited to self-access or informal learning. This leads us to the concept of self-regulated learning, which refers to how students become masters of their own learning process. Zimmerman, in 1989, was one of the first theories to explain this concept. And later, in um, 2009, he joined Moylan uh, to post a cyclical model of self-regulated learning that actually involves the interplay of metacognitive, motivational, and behavioral processes that um, are included in three stages, which I'm going to present next. Here you can see the cyclical phases model of self-regulated learning. And the forethought phase, the first one that you can see on the bottom left, refers to the learning processes and sources of motivation that happen before efforts to learn. And those processes are going to influence a student's preparation and willingness to self-regulate learning. The performance phase that you see next involves processes that occur during learning and affect concentration and performance. And the last phase, self-reflection, involve processes such as the evaluation of the learning efforts made by the learners to achieve their goals. These self-reflections, in turn, are going to influence the forethought regarding subsequent learning efforts, which completes the self-regulatory cycle. Due to the evolution of technology, research on self-regulated learning was extended from face-to-face -face environments to other contexts, including MOOCs. The first studies that focus on self-regulated learning aim to understand both the self-regulated learning profile of those participants in MOOCs 
and their behavior, as you can see there. The result of one of the most recent systematic literature review um, on this topic conducted by Alonso Mencia uh, and his colleagues show that self-regulated learning is not much study in the area of humanities, as you can see in the graph, where you would expect to find the subjects of foreign language learning, which is my field. Um, in his um, systematic literature review, um, he found the most common self-regulatory processes studied in the literature, as I'm displaying now, which are not the same is studied, is studied in the literature review of language MOOCs, as you will see next. What happens in the L MOOCs literature? Well, research on this area, on the other hand, focus on the self-motivation sources identified in the fourth phase only, such as students' belief and their self-efficacy. To give another example, Chacon Beltran, he actually moved beyond the first phase and focused on the task strategies students use to learn vocabulary in language MOOCs. So what do we know so far? There is a gap in the literature related to the processes that students use to initiate, sustain, and evaluate their learning in language MOOCs. Although there is ample research on language MOOCs, these do not focus on other self-regulatory processes identified in the cyclical model of Zimmerman and Moylan. This gap prompts the following question. Which of the self-regulatory processes identified in this model are employed by language students in an L MOOC or a language MOOC? To answer this question, my main study consists of a case study that involves 10 community-based language learners. They, as you can see, they're, they're taking uh, three different language courses. One is Spanish, the other one is Italian, and then the other one is French in the UK, all of them. The participants were free to choose the MOOC that they would study for four weeks. As you can see, they were adult learners, half of them belong to the age group between 56 and 65 years old. Most of them reported an intermediate level, uh, language proficiency level, and none of them had done a MOOC before the study, except for one. The first letter of their pseudonyms reflects the language they were studying. Now, briefly, my study consisted of an initial um, interview. Then uh, we moved to the work with the MOOC, MOOC engagement for four weeks. And during that period of time, I administered four weekly monitoring surveys. And I asked participants to take a screenshot of their MOOCs, which I call reflective photography, and an online questionnaire alongside a final interview. Uh, first, let's move on to the quantitative findings based on the self-regulatory learning questionnaire designed by Pintrich and his colleagues in 1991. You can see that participants reported high levels of self-efficacy and self-evaluation, but these were not as high as their goal setting and task strategies used during their MOOC-based learning. Now, in terms of qualitative results, this, included the, this includes the open-ended questions of the weekly monitoring surveys that ask participants for their goals, challenges, favorite moments of the MOOC-based learning, and their plans for the upcoming weeks. If we look at the um, example of the Sarah's responses, she focused on completing week one as a goal, she reported lack of time to do the activities, but she also highlighted the listening sections in the MOOCs which she enjoyed the most. Now, from the interview questions, we learned that they were aware of their type of goals as stated by Simona. Sophia also showed some defensive decisions and avoidance to join a forum 
as you normally expect that to happen in MOOCs. And um, Sarah also acknowledged the limitation of her MOOC to practice the speaking skills, but she believed that with the arrival of artificial intelligence, that might change. Lastly, I'm going to show uh, an example of the screenshot taken as part of the reflexive photography from uh, Santos MOOC, who said he enjoyed the way um, the vocabulary list was presented, which is not only isolated words as presented in other MOOCs, but it provided examples and the English translation of those words to have a better understanding. Um, now, conclusions so far. Participants, in my case study, tend to set short-term goals, but they are not very clear and realistic goals. They did not enjoy learning in a MOOC on their own, but they highlighted the activities of listening, grammar, vocabulary, and the in-class presentation they did to compensate the lack of speaking in those courses. Finally, being familiar with the content of their courses in advance actually helped them to boost their confidence and self-efficacy when learning online in a language MOOC. So far, I have found additional self-regulatory strategies beyond the task strategies used to learn vocabulary in the scope of LMOOCs, and I hope I can contribute more to the topic of self-regulated learning in MOOCs for language learning purposes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks so much, Barbara. That was awesome. Thank you. Thanks. I don't know if I went over the limit, time limit. No, not at all. No, that's, and we've got time for questions as well. So I'm going to open this up um, to um, uh, colleagues. Uh, if I can unmute people as well, if they'd like to ask a question, please <laughs> let us know. I know sometimes the chat box is not the best um, way to do this. So. So I just pause while people gather their thoughts a moment. So while people are um, thinking, I just wondered um, if you could say, um, and apologies if I, I missed something here, um, uh, a little more about the recruitment for the participants for your study, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, so that happened in uh, summer 2019. So mm -hmm. I contact uh, the gatekeepers, which are actually um, a director or a manager of the language department here at a community center in Milton Keynes, where I'm based. Um, I described their project to them. They were very uh, quite open, actually, to uh, let me approach the participants. And what I did was that um, I wanted to sort of attract the attention because those are, as you could see, participants from different age age group. Um, so I didn't want to come and overwhelm participants to do an online MOOC while they were following a face-to-face -face class. So what they, what I did is that I presented with uh, sel pre-selected MOOCs at that time. So I hand out a list of available language MOOCs at the time. I um, clarified the language level, obviously the language and the starting dates. Most of these courses were self-paced. There were not many MOOCs available at that time. So um, that made them chose made them choose um, levels of MOOCs that were quite low compared to their actual proficiency level. Um, this had some pros and some cons in terms of their performance and the way they interacted with the MOOC and also this sort of defensive reaction because as you can see not many people enjoy the activity and I think it was just because there was not much challenging for them to just for example, revising previous topics they have already covered in their face-to-face -face courses. Mm, thank you. That's that's really useful. Thank you. I can see we've got a question as well. I'm um, from Jennifer 
in the chat. I'm just going to read it out because we're not um, recording the chat box, if that's OK. So it says, I was not familiar with the 1991 survey that the original author and colleagues um, did. Could you say a bit more about it? I'm curious if you made any changes or adaptations for this group of learners. OK, thank you, Jennifer, for that question. Uh, yes, so um, the first uh, contact that I had with that survey was through the article of another a colleague that worked at that time at the Open University. So I went first to see the original, and this is basically a questionnaire that measures the self-regulated learning um, strategies of, of people. Uh, but then what I did was like I followed the adaptation that um, the colleague, as I mentioned, at the Open University did because this was related specifically for MOOCs. Uh, so what they do basically is that they just they divide the questionnaire into the three phases uh, relate that relates to Zimmerman and Moylan's self-regulated learning uh, model. And that way it was easier for me to keep my questions re re relevant and related to the model I was following because they were also following Zimmerman and Moylan. And um, basically, it just looks at details of all the processes I show you in the graph of the model. And they ask questions related to those components to measure their, their, their profile or the level of self-regulation. Thanks, Barbara. Thanks for your question as well, Jennifer. That's great. I can see you typing in the chat and we'll just wait and see if anybody else has got um, any more questions or comments that they wanted to make. Oh, great. Thank yeah. you. Oh, I can see a few people typing now, so I'll just put <laughs> It's nice to see. That's lovely. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. That's lovely. Thanks so much. So I think I'll just pause one more minute. I can see um, Sukaina is typing. Oh, wonderful. Thanks, Sukaina. So Sukaina asks, uh, so thanks, Barbara. Did the um, participants complete the MOOCs? OK, uh, good question. They were not asked to complete the MOOCs. They were just asked to work with the MOOCs two hours per week, because that's the suggested time based on the literature and based on my previous experience also working with MOOCs but at university level. But most of them, actually, they did complete the, the courses. And those are those were the, the goals that uh, participants set every week, complete module one of this course or complete all the MOOC, and they eventually did, yeah. None of them uh, gave up in the process. That's great. Thanks so much, Sakaina. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it, it's like a pick and mix, actually. Um, they just go in there and pick what is relevant to their language learning purposes. Um, and they just take advantage of that. That's why I ca I called my presentation taking advantage of MOOCs. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks so much, everyone. That's lovely. Um, wonderful. So I think unless anyone has any other questions or comments, then I think a big thank you to Barbara um, for a fantastic presentation and for sharing um, about her research um, with us today. Thanks so much, Barbara. No worries. Happy to be here and looking forward to the other two presentations. Fantastic. Thank you. Great. So thanks so much to Barbara. Um, we're now going to move on to our second um, uh, presenter in this session, um, Stanislaus. I'm just going to load up um, the slides so we should be all ready to go. Wonderful. So welcome. So I'm delighted to um, introduce, um, I gave us Stanislaus um, to the session today and he's 
talk to us about exploring the feasibility of offering data literacy services at selected private university libraries in Kenya. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Stanislaus. Um, I'm Kenyan. I live in Kenya. Kenya is on the eastern side of Africa. And, um, but I study at the University of Pretoria, which is in South Africa. However, I'm doing a distant program, so at the moment I'm still in Kenya. Um, just uh, as an advice uh, to those who are listening and those who are working kindly, this is still work in progress, and therefore I would really appreciate if um, the slides will not be shared, uh, neither one person or anybody will do a screenshot, especially my conceptual framework, which I'm developing into um, uh, uh, theoretical framework for the study. So thank you very much. So uh, like Barbara, still I've switched off my camera at the moment now. I think you have seen my face. Therefore, we'll only listen to my voice. <coughs> Please feel free to um, come in in case you realize that I'm too fast. Sometimes I get too excited and I start moving very fast. So. Uh, as my study is uh, uh, trying to look into the feasibility of uh, the university libraries offering data literacy, um, you, uh, let me give you a background a little bit. Uh, universities have been in the business of, or have been introducing uh, information literacy, <clears throat> particularly as a course that is being taught by university librarians in Kenya here. It is a requirement for all universities to introduce information literacy. And this is always taught by the librarians, developed in the, by the library, and librarians, the ones who offer it. In the process of uh, teaching information literacy, uh, some things have been emerging slowly by slowly that um, researchers need much more attention uh, from the university and particularly the library which helps them to uh, work on whatever they are doing. And we have seen RBM services being offered, that is research data management being offered by university libraries. But there is, that, that's just a component. There's a whole comprehensive whole world of, of, of uh, data management or data uh, literacy that needs to be uh, rolled out. So this is how I came into across this because I am a librarian myself. I have worked as a research librarian for a number of years, and I have discovered the needs that university library, I mean researchers are looking for. So uh, just in brief, as a definition indicates the data literacy, the ability to collect, manage, and evaluate, and apply data in a critical manner. And this could be applied in different ways or in different areas. Because uh, it has become an essential ability, that data itself has become an essential ability in the global uh, knowledge-based economy, uh, be, it, be it in politics, be it in academia, or whatever way. Uh, kindly go back. Somebody has pressed. Sorry. Okay. 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 So we, we, we are living in a world that's moving so fast and the need to inculcate the, 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 the discipline of managing data is pervading in almost every sphere of, prof of, our, of our profession, be it in civic life, be it in our professionals, be it in social life, and it's now has now become like a currency. Today, they say the more you know, the more you handle data uh, and, and your neighbor, the better for you. And that's why we have companies now that are organizations that are in the business of of, of um, mining and harvesting data for the purpose of making more business businesses such as uh, Amazon, businesses such as Google. Their interest is to harvest data so much. However, there are, there are also emerging questions now what, that are being asked around. What does it mean to be data literate in the 21st and digital world? 
who are the critical stakeholders to handle data or data that to advance data literacy or uh, how should libraries respond to data uh, literacy challenges that are now <clears throat> bedeviling people in the world today. My approach towards this study now is based on the academia itself, how data is being managed in the world of academia. And my focal point are the researchers. And I'm narrowing down my researchers to postgraduate students, particularly PhD students in the universities in Kenya and faculty members, and particularly uh, full-time faculty members in the university. So I'm narrowing down to uh, six public, six uh, private universities, sorry, six private universities in the country. And then looking at the current environment that require, whereby this, which is now necessitating the need for that. But for example, we have the publishers and we have the funders of research. For example, publishers are now requiring users to publish their data. Other than publishing your manuscript, uh, and your findings, they are requiring you to publish your data. That's one. Some funders, for example, if you have been funded by an NGO or an organization, they are now requiring you also to publish your or to make um, your data available. So all these are coming in now as things that are necessitating the needs, driving the need for data literacy for researchers. In the country, for example, in Kenya, we have uh, national agencies such as um, the, which we have one that's called NACOSTI, which provides licenses for research. We have the, uh, the National Research Fund, which are also, also requesting people or researchers to provide their data before, especially if you have been funded in one way or another. So all these drive me to uh, ask myself, how can we help researchers be data literate? Because the person that I've been receiving as a university librarian, and particularly that the one who has been working with researchers is, how do we know how to deal with this data? How do we know how to publish our data? So the whole world of a researcher revolves around a data life cycle. So any genuine good research must undergo these uh, steps that I have in seven steps that I've indicated here. One, a researcher should come up with a research plan, with a data plan, that how are you going to handle your data, where are you going to collect your data, and so forth. Secondly, they will have to carry out their data collection. They'll have in one way or another to, to go to people, either interview them or use questionnaires or whichever way they have to use as long as they collect data. And secondly, they'll have to process their data. They'll have to clean their data. They'll have to make sure that their data is in the right order. Then they'll have to analyze that data. It, no matter, there are, nowadays there are so many softwares to use. Some will be using SPSA, some will be using um, any other uh, qualitative or quantitative uh, uh, softwares. So how do they do that? So they will have to learn how to do data preservation. How do they preserve their data? Are they going to preserve their data um, locally or they're going to preserve their data in cloud and so forth? And then there's the sharing of data. And lastly, the data reuse. That is how now can you with your data act as a data for another researcher and how do you share all that. So the, all these processes here demand some little bit of know-how. And that know-how is not just um, some divine intuition that one has, and, and, and unfortunately. So one has to undergo a certain process of learning. So that is what this research is looking into. How can we develop a curricular in one way or another that will be able to help researchers to process all this, to go through all this uh, process. So in line with that, my aim is to develop, I'm waiting for my slide to come up. My aim is to develop a framework that will help institutions, particularly libraries, to have a, to, to cement research data uh, literacy in their, in, in, in their institution. 
And the four, these are the four objectives that this research will be looking at. One is to assess the faculty and postgraduate students' data literacy needs in, in, in those particular universities. What are their needs? Particularly faculty and postgraduate students. Because there might be some little bit of divergency as you look into that. Then we'll, I would love to look into the, um, to establish the organizational structure. In any university library, there is a structure of leadership or management in that matter. So is the structure in any way supporting data literacy? For example, does, do these universities have research librarians? Do they have reference services? Do they have um, uh, people who will be helping? Do they have research assistants to help researchers? And then I will, I will need to establish infrastructural readiness for, uh, for data literacy. For instance, do they have um, 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 softwares that will help researchers? Do they have uh, institutional repositories where researchers can upload their research? Do they archive uh, researchers? Uh, do they have um, instruments that will help archive uh, data? And then lastly is to develop my propo a proposed framework that uh, will help um, uh, roll out data literacy in this particular institution. Now, as, as a background to developing of a framework, I have come up across, I have come up with a conceptual framework which drives the study itself. And this framework is, is mixed up with the theory, theories or models that I've come across that support the study that or I propose that will, uh, will support the study. On the left hand side of your screen, you see there is a radical change theory. What radical change theory here is that in the first place, this was developed by Elizabeth uh, Brisson, whose main purpose was to look at how the changing digital uh, uh, world or digital age was affecting information behavior um, provision uh, for the youth. Now, my main aim of adopting this was I reached out to um, one professor who is Sheila Coral at the University of Pittsburgh, who in one way or another has tried to incorporate radical change theory into data literacy. And she, 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 say, she, did, she, she says that um, radical change theory, what it does is it tries to describe and explain the complexity or the complex pluralist context, data literacy. That is, it provides a background or a context in which one is able to see there is a change here and this change needs a reaction. And that reaction can be taken up by people. For instance, she says there is an increasing volume of data. This increment in itself is the one that necessitates us to say there is there is a, there is an avalanche of data and therefore we need to react on it. And how are we reacting on it? We need to train researchers on how to, uh, to, to handle that volume of data. And then there are new technologies that are coming up now, like software, uh, in vivo, uh, SPSS, R, and so forth. These softwares are now trying are now um, uh, challenging researchers and unless researchers are trained on how to use them and there are the, that means that they will be at a disadvantaged position um she also points out the fact that there is the penetration of data revolution data is now penetrating in all sectors of life be it academia be it politics be it economy and with that also it drives us so that is the radical change that we are experiencing today. Then in the now in the, in the context of our university setting, there's new the new roles of librarians. Librarians are now not just taking up the traditional roles whereby they were expected to sit behind a desk and offer books and point to their mouse indicating to users you must be silent in the library. No. What is happening is that libraries are taking up new roles. With the new trends of librarianship, the new roles that are coming in are radically changing everything. So already this, the, the, the framework here allows, allows these 
personally as a researcher in this context to have a look at the, con the existing context, at the researchers themselves, the context of the researchers and the research displays that researchers are in, be it social sciences or any other display. And that forms my independent variables for the study. Then as you carry out, as we carry out um, this uh, uh, training or the development of the curriculum, there will be some stakeholders that have to come on board. And the stakeholder theory um, sheds light towards this, and this was developed by Edward Freeman, who indicates that the, st the stakeholder theory, what it does is asking the question, who? Who is going to offer this training? Or who are being, who are being offered this kind of training? And my stakeholders here are several. The first stakeholders are the researchers themselves who are going to be the recipient of this particular program. But who are going to deal with this particular program in the university? So you need certain things to be in place. And some of them, these are the ones that form what I'm calling my moderating variables for the study. For example, you must have a data literacy policy in the institution. You must have a training governance. Do you have people who can train? You need a particular library, a library staff capacity who are well trained on to handle data, and then you need you need library staff knowledge in this context, and then you need lastly you need the ICT infrastructure. Furthermore, the research the research funders and publishers are coming in also as some of the stakeholders that need to be considered as um, as one lays down the uh, uh, curriculum for data literacy. Then we have also the intellectual uh, uh, capital model, which influences my study. The intellectual uh, model, um, uh, capital model is practically the intellectual know-how. Who is going to carry out that, this study and now why? Who is going to roll out the whole uh, concept of, uh, of, of uh, data literacy and the, of the institution? In my title, you must have noticed I have placed the library in, meaning that I've already pointed out the library being in the, uh, in, in the best position to roll out a data literacy plan. Why am I saying this? It is because of the experience I have had with the library itself. The library has already the experience of training library users in information literacy. Therefore, that's why I am indicating it has the intellectual know-how of carrying out data literacy. Um, they have been in the business of offering information throughout. They have been involved with in being in contact with researchers back and forth, especially university libraries that have entrenched the position of a research librarian in their structure. And then they have already they are already offering data research data management or what we call in brief RDM services uh, in libraries. So I expect, that's the reason why I expect the library to be the intellectual capital that will offer these data literacy. And those form, those are the ones, what form, that's what forms my moderating variables in this context. My mediating variables in between my dependent uh, variables and uh, my independent variables, uh, what has been, what was developed by the, uh, Fields University in Germany, and it was developed. It was a course that was developed by two gentlemen, Weiger and Kimiano. And in 2019, they, 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 they wrote a paper that was capturing all that they had done and what users had. So it was kind of a, a data literacy, but more or less they focused on RPM. But in this context, I feel they came up with a model that will influence my or that will capture what needs to be covered uh, in, in the training of, of researchers. And what some of them include um, literacy interventions, for example, a data literacy training sessions that will we'll come up will come up with curriculum embedded learning, that is, will data literacy be embedded in other curricula? For example, if you have computer computer students, will this be embedded as just part of the training? or will we uh, structure 
the training itself or literacy uh, training itself outside the 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 the, the, the curriculum uh, the computer uh, training uh, curriculum then we'll have data literacy seminars or workshops or sessions that will be rolled out so will this also be factored within the the the, 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 the program the study program of a student or they'll be labeled outside the study program but be made compulsory to students who are taking uh, this particular uh, uh, program within the university. Um, then the training uh, curriculum should cover things like data collection planning, collection of methods, processing, uh, data analysis, and data visualization, as well as publication, preservation, data reuse, and fair data. So that will form more or less the, um, uh, that's what I'm proposing as what will form a mitigating variables. At the end of it, you can see now the dependent variables. The main factor here is to have an outcome, which will be that one, the users who are researchers will now become data literate, uh, will have improved research, will have the research discoverability that will be made available, and then uh, data reusability through fair data, uh, this, uh, fair data principles and data citations will have been achieved. However, I'm coming up with complementary mediating variables, which I think without them also, users will not have been trained adequately or they will not have achieved the required maximum as far as the output is concerned. And that's why I'm introducing complementarity variables such as information literacy, because the user must also be uh, literate as far as how to search for information is concerned. The user should also be uh, digital literate. Um, they should know how to use a computer. They should know how to navigate um, different databases and sites online. And lastly, users will have some knowledge as far as statistical training is concerned. They should be statistical literacy that needs to be inculcated or be included in the training. So this forms my conceptual framework for this study. And I hope um, that uh, at the end of it all, uh, out of this, I'll now, after, after, after getting the findings from the, from the field, I'll be able to develop a framework. Uh, particularly, I'm not just narrowing it, the framework to Kenya, but for Africa, because we do not have one at all out of the research that I've done, my literature research that I've done so far, that I'll be able to develop a framework for Africa for data literacy. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stanislas. That was fantastic. Um, thank you. I'm going to open up for questions now so um please do raise your hand if you'd like me to um give you the mic otherwise you can use the chat box to share your questions i can see there's some typing um oh okay i will so you should now have the mic caroline so if you I think you just need to unmute. Yes. <laughs> Good. Um, Stanislaw, this is amazing. The work you're doing is amazing. I am in all really, really comprehensive and, and excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering one thing that I haven't seen, it might be not part of yours, you know, in your scope, yes. but nowhere I saw something called data ethics. And I wonder if you are only maybe wanting to do something very technical, maybe more of skills and pragmatic, or are you thinking? Um, in that kind of literacy program that you're developing, um, in including some kind of 
stigmatization or critical questions or so I, that that was my question okay um this is uh carol caroline okay uh okay thank you thank you caroline i think you have raised uh, a very important question um when i was developing this um I thought of covering um, data ethics under fair data, findability, whatever, and so forth. Um, but just as you've spoken, it's something that I've been giving it um, uh, a thought, uh, considering um, what's happening today. Uh, in, in Kenya, just the data uh, bill was passed uh, some just late last year. And I think that is a component that I am going to add in explicitly and as independent as it can be, rather than uh, hiding it behind fair data. And I wish to say thank you very much for noting that. Thank you so much for that. No, I would definitely no. add thank you data ethics. And I think if I may add here, because I am, I'm, I have just finished a project that I developed about uh, critical data literacies. Uh -huh. And something really important, Stanislaw, and is and and I was working with someone with with Judith in Tangasa University College, and yep. there is something really important, and is the missing data sets to people that are not included, to people that are not asked or represented or recognized, and that's a yep. huge problem, particularly in Kenya. So yep. you know, I think. I'm um, yeah. I'm. Um, I just give it a thought because I think it's really important. And if you have any question, I'm happy to, you know, to have a chat with you if you need that because I have been working quite intensely in the topic, and I'm okay. happy, to, you know, give you, I don't know, whatever kind of we can chat, whatever you think you need. Um, I I definitely appreciate that. I'll definitely appreciate that because this is still work and still under progress. And I believe this this platform also provides for such kind of opportunities for people to help each other. And therefore, I'm very, very happy uh, if you can. Well, I'll definitely check your email. Thank you very much, Caroline. Thank you. That's fun. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thanks so much, Caroline. Yeah, wonderful connection made as day <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> That's good, too. Eh? Lovely. So that's wonderful. Thank you so much. And thanks for the question, Caroline, um, as well. That's fantastic. Um, did anyone else um, have a question at this point? I had something actually coming back to earlier in your presentation that's perhaps connected to what um, Caroline was saying um, about representation. And you mentioned that you've got six private universities involved um, in your work and that you kind of had a narrowing down or, or you kind of you know, made this made this selection. I wondered if you could say a bit more about the narrowing yeah. down and the selection of, of those universities. Okay. Uh, this 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 how I'm narrowing down to the six universities. One, um, there's there are almost 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 20, 30 uh, private universities in Kenya. Um, some are fully chartered. Some are uh, uh, some are uh, operating on interim letters um, and, and, and so forth. So this is how I'm narrowing it down. One, I'm going to focus my research in, in only one region, and this is the Nairobi metropolitan city. Now, the more Nairobi metropolitan area covers the Nairobi county itself, and then extends to some satellite towns that are around Nairobi, whereby most of the people who are living in those satellite towns either work in Nairobi or they commute from Nairobi to those, you know, uh, they live in those satellite towns. So that's how I'm narrowing it down. So when I narrow it down, they come down to around 10 universities. Now, how am I again going to narrow down to six? I'm picking on one uh, universities that offer, um, that have PhD programs. So that one locks out at least two universities. So I remain with eight. Now, the eight that I'm remaining with, um, one of them only is a campus within Nairobi. So I pull out 
that one I remain with seven. Now I remain with, I mean, I yes, remain with seven. So the seven that I'm remaining with, I want to use one of them for my pilot. And therefore, so in the real sense, only six will have to be used in my study. So that's the, the criteria I'm using to narrow down to my six university. That's great. Thank you very much for clarifying. Um, and that's really um, interesting background information as well. Thank you. Um, did anyone else have any other comments or questions? Um, feel free to take the mic if you would like or use the chat box. I'll appreciate how to <laughs> I think that looks like. Just give it a minute more, but. I think that's. Yeah, I think it just looks like it remains for us to say a big thank you. That was really interesting. Thank you so much, Stanislaus. Um, thank you really interesting work and um yeah look forward to hearing more um as to how it develops um over the coming coming months thank you so much thank you welcome okay wonderful thank you so thanks so much um and we're going to move on now to our final speaker um which is um Oh, wonderful. That's great. Thanks, Dave. So next up is Dave Cormier, who's going to talk to us about dealing versus solving a real problem. So I'm going to hand over to Dave. Thank you. Um, is everything sharing? Did that actually work? Can you see my screen? Are we working here? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Excellent. OK, so uh, those were two excellent presentations and the, the sort of order and structure and depth of thought that you saw in those presentations, I hope that was enough for you for the day because you're not gonna get that here. Um, I'm very much at the start of this process. Um, I've been an alt academic my whole career, sort of saying whatever I want outside of the structures of academia. And uh, this PhD journey has been a bit of a weird one for me. Trying to get to the point where I have some kind of theoretical space that people are gonna be willing to accept. So I'm working on those frameworks it's way too big right now. I'm gonna to try to explain it to you anyways. It's gonna be way too much stuff coming at you way too quickly, but I really appreciate the opportunity to try to sketch it out. It really gives me a chance to organize these thoughts and forcing myself to try to explain this to somebody else is perfect for where I'm at with my research right now. I'm a, I'm a year into the PhD, it's super early days. Uh, but broadly speaking, what I'm trying to do is convince sciencey people that they need to change the way they look at learning. You know, COVID has been uh, crazy for people who do stuff like me. I work at the University of Windsor. Um, it's officially speaking, my title is digital strategy. Uh, but in practice during COVID, I've spent a ton of time talking to faculty about teaching online. So this is my attempt at trying to look through particularly the cognition literature and find a path inside of it that makes sense for what I'm trying to do. So like I say, it's early days, it's bits and pieces. So I appreciate your patience and any of your feedback would be super, super helpful. Okay, so scarcity. History of education is all about scarcity. Scarcity of words, when you look back three, 4,000 years ago into Mesopotamia, you've got the development of lexical lists, right? Where we had to standardize all those little wedges so that we knew what wedges meant what words, right? There was a scarcity of uh, shared understanding. Right, and so what was really, really important in education was that everybody remembered that those words meant the same thing, right? That standardization was really the drive there. That's what we were lacking. We got a scarcity of content. You know, in uh, you know, a thousand years ago, a book costs the death of two hundred sheep. Every single book was precious. Every piece of content we tried to put together was hard to get to. Um, this is based on, um, at the University of Paris, they had banned Aristotle's physics uh, because it was against the church doctrine. You had to travel hundreds of miles just to get someone to read Aristotle's physics to you. That's how scarce the content was, right? That's how hard it was to get to because there's no way you're touching that book. That book, the estimates are like $20,000 a book, plus the pain and misery of a monk writing by candlelight 
on the sheeps of dead, on the skins of dead sheep. Like the content is super, super scarce. You go forward another couple hundred years, you get a scarcity of teachers, right? We have the development of the classroom textbook. This is from Pestalozzi, uh, an amazing educational theorist who, you know, I have a textbook. It's so that somebody who does not understand what they're doing can still teach, right? We have a scarcity of trained teachers. The history of education is about solving the problem of scarcity, scarcity of access, scarcity of educate content, scarcity of all of those things. And that's all changed. Obviously, there are people who still have scarcity problems all over different parts of the world. But broadly speaking, in universities, certainly in my country here in Canada, we have moved from information scarcity to information abundance. And I don't necessarily mean that as a positive. What I'm saying is, is we are no longer trying to seek out that content and preciously serving it up from the front of the classroom. It's everywhere right? Everywhere. And yet our face-to-face -face classrooms maintain this artificial cone of scarcity, right? This artificial space inside which we don't give people access. And I give you the thing I want you to read. And I tell you what I want you to learn. And then you give that back to me. And we still try to make it about scarcity, even though our landscape is about abundance. Because you can find any book in 2021. You can outsource the content of all of our courses. This is one series of lectures that I have on my telephone. It cost me $15, 24 half hour lectures uh, on South America. The guy who gives these lectures actually named one of the towns. That's how serious he is into the research. And it comes with 197 pages of lecture notes. It cost me $15. The lectures are amazing, right? We can automate the grading. Right? So this stuff is no longer scarce and all that control that we had over the learning process, poof, it's gone, right? Because we can no longer control the content, we can no longer control the access a student has, right? Because it's no longer scarce. It's a huge impact. Now, again, I'm not suggesting this is good or bad. I have feelings about that, but it's not even important. The fact is, is that it's changed. And we, that control that we've always had, that artificial scarcity we've always had, is just no longer there. So if the content is everywhere and we can AI automate the process, what exactly are we doing here as educators? What's our place? And this is the question I would say that I've talked to probably a hundred faculty in the last year that are coming to this realization that their positionality inside of the learning process has fundamentally changed, right? Once you bring in the abundance, the position of the educator is no longer the same. You no longer have that control. You no longer have the same dictatorial control over what's going on. As soon as you bring in the digital platforms, like let alone the access to the content from inside the school, but when we're working online, it gets even more profound, right? So we need a pedagogy for this abundance. I hate to say nice things about Martin Weller when he's in the room, but this does come from his 2011 paper uh, as the foundation of this work. Uh, and what I'm looking to do is figure out theoretically where this fits for me inside of the history of the research and education so that I can get that, that sort of idea crystal clear in my mind before I get forward towards the research questions start to come out of this process. So for me, a pedagogy, a good pedagogy, and I don't have this slide in here, but clearly this is a step I need to make. A good pedagogy is one that engages students, and that's how I would evaluate the effectiveness. And when we look at online learning, man, do we have an engagement problem. Holy moly, do we have an engagement problem. When you look at the problems that people have had in the last year, so much of it comes back to, I'm not engaged, there's no interaction no sense of community, no interaction, right? This is the negative impact of the process. So they look online, they say, oh, when I'm teaching, my pedagogy, quote unquote, is not working because there is no engagement. And that's the sort of piece here. So what does that look like? This is a, a, a little, I hate to call it a framework, but from a guy named Schlechty, he ran um, basically an engagement institute for years in the States. And he has this nice, neat little model that talks about 
this distinction between the sort of rebellion retreatism on the bottom uh, and then compliance and engagement. I really, really love this, this sort of notion of compliance and students. So much of what we do is directed towards and compliance, right? So we've got this, this sort of ideal of intrinsically motivated, engaged students. And then under that, we have, I love the, the distinction between strategic and ritual compliance as well. So you have this idea of strategic, strategic compliance. Those are the students who do exactly what they're told. They read our rubrics very carefully and they do exactly what we ask them to do. And the claim here is that that's not engagement, that's compliance. That's us telling students what to do and them doing what they're told. And you've got ritual compliance. We've got students who are like, yeah, I'm gonna coast through this and just get the thing done. Now I would suggest that a lot of faculty would look at the ritually compliant and say those students are not engaged but they think of students who are strategically compliant as engaged. And I'm saying, I'm suggesting here that that's part of the problem. Because when we look at these students, this is from the Canadian data, uh, but I would suspect it'd be similar in other places. In the 50s, we had about 6% of our population going into undergrad education, undergrad university education. Now it's somewhere around 30%. We've actually gone from 19 to 30 in the last 25 years. So we have a lot more students coming into higher ed, which is great. But it changes why people are coming in. If everybody just goes, and I talked to, I've had three students uh, tell me that they went into biology because their mom told them they could get a job. So they had to go into science. And I spent years working in student engagement inside of schools. Uh, I was in charge of retention. I've done first year advisement, new student orientation, and lots of that kind of end of the administration side. And students are taking degrees because they were told to. They're going to university because they're going to university. They're not going there with a drive to learn. They're not going there with something specific they're trying to find out. They're going because they're supposed to go. And in many cases, they're choosing their degrees because someone suggested they should. Or my favorite, they decided at 12 that it was easier to tell adults that they were going in to be an engineer. And they've been saying, I'm gonna be an engineer since they were 12. And then they got there and they didn't wanna change their mind because it made them sound fickle. So then they go in for engineering. I've had that conversation a dozen times with students. It takes a while to get there, but then they realize that they decided they wanted to do this a long time ago and they just didn't know how to stop, right? And they're coming out of a really standard structured K-12 system. Certainly true in Canada, certainly true in the States, different, true in a lot of other parts of the world. You get to East Asia where I taught for years, uh, even more true, right? So suddenly we're asking, we're looking for intrinsic motivation. We want students to want to learn and yet everything we do is about creating that kind of strategic compliance. I had a student yesterday look at me. So I'm working with a bunch of co-op students now. And he looks at me and goes, look, you asked me this question this morning and his name's Brandon. You asked me this question this morning and you said um, that you wanted my opinion, but I just assumed it was a trick that you actually had an answer you wanted me to give because nobody ever asks my opinion and really wants an answer. They always know what the answer is going to be, and it's always a test. Like that's exactly what we got to push back against, right? That way in which our system develops that kind of strategic appliance. But there's another side to this, right? So, I mean, are we trying to turn them the best students into graduate, or are we trying to change lives? And that's the question for me. How do we best develop that intrinsic motivation? Because our schools are really effective at compliance. You know, if you, <laughs> so many faculty say, look. I had students who would always pay attention when I was in class, but then online they don't pay attention. Yeah, sure. If you capture 30 people and put them in a room with nothing else to do, and then you force them not to do anything else, of course they're going to pay attention to you. There's nothing else to look at, right? Our cl physical classrooms are so geared for compliance. The web doesn't allow for that kind of compliance. You're not going to be able to use compliance in online learning, even if you think compliant, even if you like strategic compliance, even if you think that's what learning is, it's not gonna work on the internet. It's just not gonna work. Uh, because all of the problems that you give students where you're like, here, take this problem and solve it, those problems are already solved on the internet. Something like Chegg in engineering, every published problem you have ever seen, the answer is on Chegg. If the question you ask a student is a compliance question with a clear defined answer, they already have the teacher's copy of the textbook. They have all of those answers already. And so if you 
force students into this compliance process that could have worked in that artificially scarce face-to-face -face space is simply not going to work online because those extrinsic motivators, those compliance motivators are great for repetitious tasks. You can govern a repetitious task inside a physical classroom by watching somebody and making sure that they're doing the, rep the repetition. Online, you can't do it. And plus, the things that I'd be interested in, things like creativity and intuition, those heuristic tasks, it's counterproductive to take a compliance model for that. And compounding this, students don't even want us to do this because they know the game of schools as it's currently structured. And when you start saying, hey, I want you to actually care about this, there's a certain amount of pushback you get from students inside that situation too. Okay, so a pedagogy for abundance. What does it look like? Again, we're just talking about the theoretical bits I'm trying to organize right now. So Chi and Glasser talk about a classroom problem as a place where variables to input are controlled, right? I know what the question is, I know what the answer is, and then I can give you an objective a learning objective, and I know what I want you to learn, and then I'm going to measure that you've learned it at the end of the day. It's a classroom problem. A real life problem is one where those variables are not controlled, right? So classroom problem, real life problem. Herbert Simon, Nobel Prize winner, chess aficionado, develops artificial intelligence in the 1970s to try to solve, try to beat chess players at chess. He looks at well structured problems. The operators and goal tests are sharply defined. Again, you're looking at the same thing as a classroom problem here, ill-structured to the effect that they're vaguely defined. And in his writing, when he talks about ill-structured problem, you can almost see the hand wave, the shrug. He's like, oh, those ill-structured problems, they're no fun. Now, you follow Herbert Simon through the literature, and what you're going to find is all of these cognition scientists quoting him and doing all of their testing on chess games and chess players, things where it is a game that you can win, a classroom problem, a well-structured problem. And well-structured is better, right? It says well-structured, it's in the name. My learning objectives are well-structured. Isn't my learning supposed to be transparent? Aren't I supposed to clearly define for students what they're gonna learn? Well, yes, if we're into the compliance process, and if we believe that chess playing is the ultimate goal of the learning process. And I mean, I literally, this chess journey I've been on has been hilarious. It pops up everywhere. And it all goes back to Herbert Simon and another guy from the 60s, whose name I can't remember. He calls them ill-defined problems, ill-structured is the other language. But if that's what we think we're looking, if the game of school is actually what we're into, if strategic compliance is what the ultimate goal is, if getting students to do what they're told is what we want, the other side of this is Riddle and Weber's Wicked Problems, which is an amazing article from 1973. I think it is still a super, super valuable piece. And it follows the other thread of the ill-structured, right? They're real world problems. They're the other side of Chi's argument, right? So there's classroom problems and real world problems. You could also call them well-structured and ill-structured. And those ill-structured problems come into this wicked problem business here. Now. One more piece of the puzzle. A novice preferred explanation that demonstrated simple cause and effect relationship. It's the same piece, right? It's the classroom problem, simple cause and effect. I've told you what I want. You've given me what I want. I've given you a problem to solve. You have solved the problem. Experts have increased flexibility, more awareness of constraints and the ability to impose meaning on ambiguity. They are dealing with problems. A novice solves a problem. An expert deals with a problem. So. Does a pedagogy of abundance mean we're always, we always need to be teaching for experts? That's kind of where I'm going with this. So what we need to do is do the expert style teaching from the beginning. We always need to have the ambiguity. We need to live inside that ill-structured environment because the value that we actually have to offer as, as faculty, as teachers, is not the answer that we have to the question because the answer exists on our telephones anyway. It's our experience with, and our mistakes dealing with problems that we have as the value add that we have inside the university structure or the K-12 system now. So if our classroom problems are gonna be problems that we solve, 
Chegg is going to do that anyway. Chegg is just one of a hundred online websites that collect together the answers to the questions. Pedagogy of abundance needs to be built on ill-structured problems, teaching people to think like experts from the beginning. This is the argument that I'm looking to make. And it sounds an awful lot like andragogy, which is the thing that I'm dealing with right now. So that's where I am, guys, in the, the work that I'm doing right now. It's sort of a snapshot piece um, of what I've been doing. And I hope that wasn't so overwhelming we just the jumble of words that it that it actually made something, uh, some kind of sense. Um, but like I say, early days in the research now, and uh, still looking for feedback from folks. Thanks so much, Dave. That was fantastic. We are open for questions That's and comments. The best, Beck. What are you talking about? That's all over the place, but I appreciate your kindness. Well, I can see we had, um, just looking in the chat box as well. Ooh. Yeah, so Barbara is funny. Um, if you look at the work of Malcolm Knowles, who is a fantastic educational theorist from the 60s, 70s, 80s, actually wrote into the 2000s, I think. Um, a lot of what you end up, what I ended up saying, and I'm reading back on it now, it kind of looks like andragogy. You know, you need to treat your students like they're adults. And, and to some degree, when you look at this novice expert, you could also make child adult as another one of those distinctions. Where we treat our university students as children in their first year or two, and then suddenly expect them to be adults whenever they come in. So good question, Sukina. Um, it's, I think, the place where I've spent a lot of my career talking to the, preaching to the converted, you know, I, where I've had presentations and conversations and as a consultant and whatever, when I talk to people who already sort of buy that education is complex and that things are difficult and that um, the people who come out to, to talk with me about stuff are not this group who believe that the human experience is something that we can, you know, count on a blackboard. So when I say that it's not really the science, like, like learning in science specifically, but rather they're the ones I'm particularly concerned about. I want to make an argument that will stand up um, against somebody who's going to go, somebody like Daniel Willingham, who is a, a researcher who believes in memory and thinks that all this crazy, I look at things online business is a totally total waste of time. But if you look at Willingham's work, and he's been writing for 30 years on this, um, all of his examples of success are based on compliance. So when he says students learn better, he means students are more compliant. Um, and it's that, that the, the research hinges on that distinction, right? If what you want from students is compliance, well then yeah, sure. Uh, Behaviorism is going to work. Of course it is. That's what behaviorism does is it creates compliance. So I need that sort of piece that will speak to those science educators that'll say, look, this is what your goal is. It's engagement. You want students to care about what you're doing. You don't want them to just respond to the things you tell them to do. You think my argument is strong but boring. Thanks, Martin. That's really kind. Um, I meant so my, question, looking, my question was boring. So I, I meant my question was boring. I, I, know, I, know, I, know. So, I, I understood. Yeah. When I looked at it the first time, I was like, ooh, that was hard. Well, but then I, that's, like, harsh. <laughs> that's harsh. <laughs> this go, this go is a bear pit. No, I didn't. So, so what I want to do um, is I've been looking at sort of a something called an essentialist research method, which is um, really kind of like cheating. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to talk to probably 10 or 12 people who have been doing this. And I want to dig in to try to find out what the shared assumptions are that we have. I mean, you're probably on my target list, Martin, where we sit down and sort of talk about what the underlying assumptions that we have in this sort of open pedagogy business and try to find some patterns in there that can actually speak to this framework, right? So 
I can say that I think that all this still structured stuff makes sense, but what is what does it really look like um, for the other experts who are out there who've been trying to do similar things? So it is really a very fluffy, um, deep researchy business that I want to do, like deep conversation kind of research that I want to do. Um, I have a funny feeling I'll probably end up smacking a mixed methods broad survey on the end of it just because it sells better. Um, but the real interest I have is in long conversations with people about what their underlying assumptions are. Run now. Well, that's great, Jennifer. I'm glad that's helpful. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure, Caroline. Um, my internet is a bit dodgy, and I don't know how to raise my hand, so I'll maybe be, I don't know, it wasn't my turn. <laughs> but <clears throat> I wondered about two things. One is, are you in an online context all the time, right? So that's the teaching you are kind of exploring. Is that online or is it face-to-face? -face? Um, I mean, right now I'm online all the time because we're not allowed back in our schools. Um, but I, I don't think there's a real distinction. The thing that I'm interested in is the impact of abundance on the learning process, whether that happens in a face-to-face -face environment or not. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think I so I hear you, and I um I feel a lot in my own teaching what you're saying. Um, but I, while you were, um, I was looking at your slides. I was, I was thinking that we tend to make the assumption that, for example, because the tools are out there, we're going to have experts, um, st students being experts in in using the tools. But that is not the case. And so I agree with the abundance. I do agree with it. I'm not sure that it, it, it immediately and unproblematically implies that if we have the thing there, whatever, the books, the teachers, the content, it means that, how can I say, that you're going to make, that you're going to use it in a way that it transforms you because learning really is about transforming yourself. It's about, it's about, you know, it's about in the struggle of learning what you don't know that you transform yourself and then you come on the other side as a, as a different human being in a way. It's, I mean, and so I, I, this struggle, which I think is really the, the learning, if, if you want someone to learn, there is a struggle that you need to expose them to mm -hmm. because that's where you engage. So you don't, you don't, you don't, how do you say you don't die in the struggle? I'm exaggerating this, but no, no, but I know I totally agree with you. Yeah. And so I, I think that 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 thinking about this this space of struggle, how do you really can you engineer this and quote unquote engineer, um, so that that struggle really keeps you engaged in the experience of learning. And so I think you know there's there is a lot of the connections that you do and that you make with your students while they are in the struggle that you have designed. So the abundance, I'm not I'm I'm I haven't you know, read that much. But yes, there is abundance, but I'm not sure the problem is that there is abundance. I think the problem is really how do you how do you how how do you walk the struggle bit with your students and what you do in that space? Um, and I think that's key. We are exactly on the same side. Um, what the, the thing that I'm trying to do here is is not convince you, Caroline, by the sounds of the way you talk about teaching, I would love to be in your classroom. What I'm trying to do is convince the people who think that they can still give simple assignments to their students, have them go home. Those students, what they're doing with that abundance, they're not doing the good things that you're talking about. What they're doing is copying and pasting the answers from a university, from some website they found and not doing any of the work. And then the response from faculty is they're trying to police and trick students and catch them from stealing the work online rather than fundamentally realizing that their approach, their scarcity approach that they've been accustomed to using just doesn't apply, right? So the tricks that they would have used, which is I'm gonna give you a problem to solve, which is gonna force you to think about it. Well, the students can just work around that now because if it's a solvable problem, the answers just exist. So they are exactly like you said, not using that abundance in a positive way at all. They're using it to just go find the answer, give the answer and then go in. And then the response of the faculty, instead of changing the way they look at it, is to 
lurk online trying to catch students posting answers so that they can punish those students for cheating. And this is like, I don't mean there's like 5% of the population in this situation. From my experience in the last year, probably 50. But yeah. it's, not, it's not educators like you. It's educators who, like frankly, the number of faculty I've talked to at dozens of institutions in the last year literally never thought about this. They teach exactly like they were taught 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And they, when you say, I mean, they're smart people. So when you say, look, think about solving problems versus dealing with problems and whatever, right? And I start walking through this and I go, is this actually even what you want? And they go, oh, wait, they'll say stuff like, I've been covering content for years. And why do I even try to cover it? I know they don't remember it. I know they don't understand it because I do too much of it. But I've always felt like rigor meant give them a lot of content, right? Mm. That's what we're dealing with. Those are the people that I'm talking to, not, I mean, complexity with which you look at it is fantastic. Yeah, I get it. I get it. I, I just, I think that it's a human thing. I mean, teaching is <sighs> human, you know, and if you, if you, I mean, funny that you tell me this and, and I do teach from, from my heart. It sounds cheesy, but that's what I do. And, and, and that is what really engages people. It is the relationship really. I mean, I have taught for 30 years already and in different places and 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 in different even um social um how do you say strat strata so different social layers um very very deprived people in Venezuela that you know live in 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 unbearable conditions and very then you know rich and and I think it is the human connection really that that makes a difference is is you you loving what you do, so you really would never ever go away without having ignited some kind of struggle that you can walk along with. Totally. Um, but yeah, you know, well, you yeah, it's a it, it's a you have a wicked problem to solve, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Thank you. I just want to address a couple of the comments in the chat room. So, Sukena, I, I definitely think the graduate attribute stuff in K-12 and in university totally lines up with this. So we say, we want students to be good citizens. And then we tell them, being a good citizen is, list me the five qualities of being a good citizen. And then the student lists the five qualities of being a good citizen. And then we go, good job, you're a good citizen. It's just compliance. There's no actual change. Like, like Caroline's saying, there's no transformation happening there. I'm just being obedient. So I, I definitely think so. I think the values that I'm talking about are, in, are, are, in, are deeply embedded in our talking about the system, but don't change everybody's way of actually teaching. And I mean, in K-12, it's certainly not rewarded, right? If you have an ill-structured assignment in K-12, you're going to get a call from a parent saying, this isn't fair. My student's going to get a, my child's going to get an 88 instead of a 94, and they're going to lose money on automated scholarships going into university. Like, that's the phone call you're going to get. We don't reward it. So I'm not suggesting, to, to Barbara's point, I'm not suggesting that people are experts. I'm suggesting that we teach them the way we would teach an expert. So instead of saying, here are the foundational concepts you need to remember, look at a first year physics class. What we do is we teach people to remember a whole bunch of things because they need a grounding, right? They need to know what all these words mean. So we spend the whole time focusing on teaching them what the words mean. Right. In that, in that sense, we teach them the novice skill of being able to respond to the question, what is this science word with the answer to that question? But then all of that, all of that knowledge is, is atomized. And you may think that that kind of mastery approach is great. And, and OK, I, I disagree, but I understand there's lots of literature that supports it. But when you look at that mastery literature, you look at that step by step atomized approach it's simply not going to work anymore, right? It is not going to work because it's, it's compliance-based, right? Nobody's enjoying learning definitions. Um, nobody's engaged in the definition process. Um, but even if you do think that's a good idea, teaching out is you're not going to be able to do it online. It's not going to work. They're just going to go find the definition, give it to you, right? I, I had another student yesterday. He's like, well, no. There's school and then there's learning. If I need to learn something, I go online. Literally what he said to me about his own classes. See, I don't look at my, my professor's lecture notes. The internet notes are going to be better anyway. <laughs> I, that's awful. 
can I can I ask a question there? For sure. Yeah, this is Danish. I, I I think I totally agree with you. Uh, I accidentally found myself in a classroom teaching because um, I'm a trained librarian by profession, and because the Commission for University Education wanted librarians to be the ones to teach information literacy, so I found myself in classroom, and I've been teaching all through. And I seem to come across the uh, same problem. I am an administrator of uh, anti-plagiarism uh, software. I, I, don't want, I don't like calling anti-plagiarism software because it, it does not detect plagiarism. it does not detect plagiarism, but it, what it checks is similarity. And I come across lecturers who are waiting just for students to make mistakes and you know, they go punish. And I tell them, this is not supposed to be used for punitive measures. But it's supposed to use supposed to be used to help students understand how to do an assignment and so forth. But my question is to you: I don't know how it's done, whatever you are in Canada, whatever. Is it lack of pedagogical skill on the on the side of of especially us teachers? Because, for instance, we pluck somebody from the industry and we bring him into class without any pedagogical skills, any teaching skills. Uh, because somebody trains as a librarian like me, and then later on finds himself in class and then starts teaching. Other than the teachers who, who, who teach, um, uh, let's say, a high school and, and, and the primary school in Kenya here, who go through how to teach. You know, they, they, they are taught on how to teach, how to interact and with students and pupils, but in on the in the university level, is somebody is a professional. He 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 he's a mathematician. He's an economist and finds himself in class. So, do you think it's lack of pedagogical skills? Kind of, I don't know. I, I don't at all. I appreciate the question. <laughs> um, I would say that half, three quarters of the um, schools of education would disagree with me in terms of what I've just said, right? They would suggest that clarity, clear learning objectives, mastery learning are all awesome models for how we should teach. And that if I dug into what they were looking for, what they're actually designing for is compliance. I would say that lots of people have been trained to do compliance teaching for years inside of the system. Um, we are particularly bad here in Canada in terms of our universities because we don't do any formal training for university professors. Our, our friends in the UK do a much, much better job. Uh, so we're particularly behind here. Uh, you'll have lots of faculty who've never taken a second of professional development in teaching at all. In their, and it's not in the PhD program, and it's not in the postdoc programs, and it's not in the intake into a university to a tenure track position, and it's not part of their tenure experience. I've tons of people who have never done any. Uh, so we're particularly bad in that sense. Um, but I would also suggest that a lot of that training is not very good um, because it so much of the issue to me is that fundamentally what we think learning is. So like I said earlier, when I heard Caroline talk, I was like, man, I'd love to talk to Caroline for a long time. It sounds like we really agree on this. Um, but lots of people don't. Lots of people think that learning is basically compliance, right? As long as they can repeat back to me what I said, they have learned. So it's not just the training, it's good training. That's the issue. I think we're over time. Sorry for that long answer back. No, that's fantastic. And thanks to um, everyone for the questions and discussion. It's been um, fantastic. Loving the connections being made between different people's work as well. It's um, yeah, been really good. Um, yeah, thanks so much, Dave. And um, a big thank you to all our speakers, Barbara, Stanislas and Dave. It's been a really awesome session. Um, uh, we'll be back again next month. Um, uh